This is the Empire Podcast, released January 17th, 2022, episode 573, Mixed Signal Education with Philip Salmony. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. Hi, I'm Philip. I run the Phil's Lab YouTube channel and a professional hardware engineering consultant on the side. Hey, Philip. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Chris? Good, good. I, I was wondering because, you know, I know you go by, go by Philip, but it's Phil's Lab. So is it like kind of like uh, you get into the lab and you relax and you're like, oh, call me Phil. Is it? Is uh, it? Is... <laughs> well, it's always a thing because Philip's Lab, I think, would sound a bit strange. And also, I never mm, know because I'm... See. From Germany, I'm called Philip, and when I go to England, people usually call me Phil, so I never know what to choose. Yeah, yeah. So, I just like that idea of like you know, like the lab is your happy place, and that's where you go to relax, and like yeah. it's just like a you know. That's true. Chill. Yeah, I mean, chill with Phil. You know, I think I'll, I'll keep that. <laughs> I'll keep the chill with Phil on my on my yeah. channel now. I think it might yeah, make that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you could do when you do like Q and A sessions, maybe you could do that. You could have like a pipe, and you'd be like, uh, you know, drinking a glass of scotch or something. And uh, perfect, yeah. Put on a little yeah. tweed jacket. I think that sounds good. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. You're giving me a good idea. So I was running yeah, out of fire, content fire for in YouTube. Fire the background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wish I just had a fireplace back home. I'm afraid it's a bit lower yeah. budget than that. So mm. well, or where you are now. So you're in, in Denmark now, uh, where it's uh, in time of year is a little chilly. Yeah. So, so it's. So. Yeah, it's working its way down to fairly low temperatures again. I'm just getting used to it. I yeah. thought like Germany and England was bad in terms of weather, but Denmark really mm-hmm. does beat that. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know how it goes. Well, I knew how it goes. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, after your move now, I guess you yeah. can look forward. I guess does it get pretty hot where you are now? It does. Yeah. It, it it'll get up in the 40 C range with with a lot of humidity. So like, oh my god, 40 okay. C and like you know 90 percent humidity. It's, uh, and, it's okay. a rough time. <laughs> I'm, if I'm, honest, I'm not sure if I would make the move to such a warm climate, but yeah, yeah. not bad. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see okay. how it goes. We'll see if I melt this year. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can freeze on the other hand, so I think we'll mm-hmm. make a match there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how long have you been doing the Phil's Lab uh, channel? Well, it started off as kind of, I just, I was looking into STM32, how to develop your own microcontroller board, going from Arduino to making something more producible or something that looks more professional. And that was, was it May, 2020? I was looking Mm -hmm. into that and I uploaded this like three hour video just for me myself, first of all, just trying to detail how do you make a microcontroller board Mm -hmm. uh, or with SMB components. And that was really bad audio quality as well. And somehow it got shared around and then took off. So I assume that was the moment where it, it kind of hit. So May, 2020, what's that? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I you started, you know, hitting my radar because you were doing stuff in KiCad or KiCad, as you mm-hmm. call it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that's great. I, th- I think specifically, you know, like it was the start to finish tutorial piece of it, like being able to see, like mm-hmm. people really love that being able to see everything there. And maybe they, you know, stop it and, you know, take a break after a half hour, come back to the next day. But, but being able to see that whole process is super valuable, especially for people that have never done a board before. Yeah. No, and I think that was also the reason. Another thing is like the KiCad, KiCad. I still don't know how to say it, and I still mess it up. You say KiCad, right? I say KiCad, but it's really KiCad. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I never know, <laughs> to be honest. I can't, I can't deprogram myself even if I tried. Uh, I've I, actually I, thought about doing a, a, a fundraising thing where <laughs> uh, you know people could donate to one or the other. And uh, you know, yeah. if, if we hit a certain threshold, I'll stop saying KiCad. But in my head, it's still always going to be KiCad. Yeah, yeah, almost like a swear jar or something. Every time you say, Kai yeah, Kai exactly. Jata. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I keep messing it up as well. But yeah. But basically, it was the thing. I think I was just scouring through data sheets and application notes, trying to figure out how to. It sounds basic now, but at the time, every time I guess you introduce something new, it was quite difficult. Piecing all everything together. What do coupling capacitors need? You need certain pull-ups here. What does like is this boot mode pin do? And I kind of wanted everything in one place. And I guess that then also helped, as you say, quite a lot of other people to see the whole process in one place. Yeah. So as a reference, basically, for myself, it started. But oh, That's great. That's great. And I think that as well with like the, you know, STM32 is this very popular platform. But when people are like, so someone might go and see like a black pill or equivalent kind of dev board that's out there making that leap from like, 
a black pill and knowing that there's SDM 32 on there and then like being like, well, I want to build my own board, understanding yeah. that piece and like the, all the other stuff you have to look up, like the data sheet that you're talking about. Yes. That's another really valuable piece. I feel like. Exactly. Yeah. Just learning how to read a data sheet and pull stuff together. And it, I just feel like it enables so much more in terms of projects being able to just go to data sheet and then pop that in your design rather than relying on plugging in or using an Arduino board and using these weird GPIO headers that always come loose. I don't know if what your experience was with that, or if you had something like that, where you moved from an Arduino based system to STM32 or whatever microcontroller you were using. You know, for me, it was, I, I came in from the analog side, so it was always okay. weird for me anyways. Like I, I got to make microcontrollers very late in the game, I feel like. Okay. Not late in the game, but late in my career even. You know, a lot okay. of my stuff, I started out in the analog space. And so it was like, oh, well, there's digital people taking care of that. And, you know, where I was starting at, at Keithley, they, they were using like like 68,000 parts as well. So I, I was not yeah. I was not super keen to get in on that with like tool chains yeah. and all other stuff too. Um, it wasn't until okay. much later where I was like, oh, this just enables all this other stuff. And so, you know, I went the normal route of, I might've had background of electronics, but I went the normal route of, you know, Arduinos and, you know, then yeah. using Adafruit, SparkFun type stuff as well. And just learning like that. Yeah. So. But you started off with analog design. It's like straight out of uni or how was that? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I okay. did, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I went to university and mm -hmm. learned a little bit about electronics. And then I went to work at Samsung in a chip fab. Okay. And uh, I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. And that's like a very specific career path. And so then I went back and went to work at Keithley Instruments where, where my alma mater was. And uh, my friend got me a job, a past guest of the show, Dave Young, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's when I really kind of, that was my true learning. That's what I, I tell people is like, that's when I really started learning electronics at the okay. age of 25. So <laughs> 23. Yeah. But that's really cool. Because I, I, after I graduated, I know for graduates, it's probably a lot harder to find like analog design jobs. But that yeah, to yeah. me is one of the coolest part of electronics is analog design. It's a shame you probably need quite a lot of years of experience to actually then get into that field. I mean, Keithley, they do like measurement equipment, test equipment, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's not as needed these days because of all the other stuff that's out there. You know, like you go... I'm sure you've read like Jim Williams app notes from linear technology, yep. right? Like yeah. his app notes are amazing, but like They're you really go and cool. look at all the stuff that's in there. Like one of his best app notes is how to do a thermocouple, like a really precise thermocouple measurement circuit. Okay. And for a long time that was like, and like it, it still holds up as a circuit. It's still like a very, you know, it's got like a digital drive circuit to, with like some logic gates to drive one side of a transformer to send data, you know, so it's isolated and stuff like that. And like, it is a very interesting, very cool circuit. But these days you can literally buy, well, outside of the past two years, you can just go and buy a thermocouple circuit that that yes. is at or better than that performance. Mm -hmm. And it's almost irresponsible to go and do what he did if, yeah. if you were a design engineer. You know, that's just yeah. kind of the world we're living in now. And so I feel like, you know, the, the analog stuff is like super intriguing, super fun kind of design and debug stuff. But if you were put on the spot by a company and, and said, design me a thermocouple circuit, it's like, that is not the right answer, I don't think. I don't know what your experience has been with that. No, I completely agree. It's always, but as you say, it's kind of the fun of developing or understanding what actually goes on in an analog circuit. But then the delay, you would just yeah. choose an IC to do the job for you and could do it a million times better. I had the same right, thing right. when I was quite into audio electronics. And if you want to just design your own discrete operational amplifier, for example, yeah, you might get lower noise levels, but the effort and the gain versus just buying like, you know, an E5532, it's like marginal compared to the design cost and board space and so on. Yeah. But I just love it as a learning experience and I wish there were just more jobs or maybe I was born too late. <laughs> I should have been born, you know, 20, 30 years ago to be able to do that kind of stuff. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Jim Williams, didn't he have like a, it's almost like a cookbook or something. We had some really tough analog design questions. I saw that on a YouTube channel called like Dev TTYS Zero. I don't think the guy actually still runs it anymore, but he was looking like oh. some Jim Williams, really bizarre questions on analog circuitry. And that's mm. really something mental to test like your knowledge. But yeah, that's a good, I mean, it's a good way to do it. I don't, I don't know about the specific test. Yeah. I know that I have the books where they kind of packaged up all of Bob Dobkins and mm -hmm. Jim Williams' app notes. It's called Analog Circuit Design, like volume one and two. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting to go look through. But okay. I, I don't I don't know about the, the test you're talking about specifically. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I 
not sure it's entirely a test. It was basically a book with a collection of examples and he would give you a circuit and then tell you, or how do you design a circuit to do this certain function? Oh, okay. for the life of me, can't remember it, of course, now. But okay. yeah, on that YouTube channel, as I said, I think that's where you can find yeah. it. But, okay, but, I'll go I'll go look at that. Okay. Yeah, that's the dev TTY, you said zero? D- TTY is zero or something like that. Okay. It has cool. just some pretty cool videos on like, you know, Salon key filters, a lot of analog electronics. And a shame he didn't continue with his videos, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, well, as you know, the stress of YouTube is... Uh, yes. It is a... Uh, Harsh mistress, That's true, <laughs> always wanting yeah. more. Exactly. Yeah. But, but you just went. You then went away from analog design, or how did you then progress uh, yeah, after I mean, Keith? I know I went to an industrial. I went to ABB after that. Okay. Big in Europe, right? Yes, very. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then after that, you know, into marketing type stuff, and yeah, I kind of okay. took a right turn and then came back to it. You know, came back to the yep. the technical side. That's what I've been excited about. Yeah. And you know, like it's wanting to build stuff on an everyday basis and. I don't know. It's yep. just uh, the stuff that we, you know, both of us like doing, right? It's like exactly. build, building up circuits and stuff like that. I mean, yep. you you have all these designs. One of the things I really like about your videos is that you have a lot of stuff around like mixed signal, which I feel like mm-hmm. is kind of, a, you know, it's kind of getting into that analog side of things and all the yep. analog considerations, but still using all these chips that require or that, that maybe you don't have to do all the, the discrete yeah. analog design. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's kind of also the thing because... I'm a musician and I've always wanted to kind of combine electronics with audio. And as soon as you want to combine audio with electronics, it's going to have to look some sort of analog side, especially if you're, I was making or designing this guitar pedal, this effects mm-hmm. pedal, which you can essentially reprogram to do distortions over like reverbs, delays. Mm-hmm. And of course, for any ADC or DAC, you're going to have to design the analog circuitry around it. And once you've done it like a couple of times, you know how to do it. But yeah, it's this kind of, mix and boundary which i think is quite interesting not getting too deep into designing the best analog front end or the best you know dac interface but yeah just yeah, something yeah. between ba- i think yeah. balancing costs too right i mean that's you exactly. could spend 30 dollars on a dac and it's yeah. like all right well that might mm. have the specs you think you need but like can you optimize so that you can spend two dollars on a dac and yeah. you know still make it sound pretty good or you know like exactly. all of the engineering trade-offs that are required especially audio where kind of people have an idea of what they think they want, but then actually like tying it back to truly needed specifications has got to be kind of tough. And that's the thing. And you see all this audio hype, you know, 24 bit uh, analog digital converters running at almost 200 kilohertz of a sample rate when it actually comes down to it, you know, much lower is even fine and just finding that kind kind of balance. Right. Yeah. But no, I think it's a really interesting field, mixed signal. And that's also, as I, I guess, shared with you, was the, the mixed signal course that kind of yeah. tries to at least outline some of these uh, design procedures, both on the analog mm-hmm. and the digital side. And I kind of want to summarize at least my findings over the last few years into something that is kind of accessible for someone new to that field. Yeah, well, let's talk about the course. So you have a new course available. This is on, it's hosted on the same, uh, on Robert Fairnick's uh, Fedevel site, but it's, it's your course on there. And people can follow along and, and do it. What, what, what's kind of like, what's the outline of the course? Yes, exactly. So it's hosted with or by Robert Ferenick, who runs Federal Academy. His kind of sub site is called Federal Education, where other people that are invited can publish their own courses. So yeah, the outline of the course is essentially starting you through a whole design procedure for a mixed signal product or prototype. So you're given a very basic part, uh, design description. So it should be a USB-based signal generator and signal analyzer. You're trying to minimize cost. And how do you go from a really very vague design description to a final product that you can order at a manufacturing house? So I start off giving you the design description and then deriving the system requirements kind of step by step. What does the USB need to be capable of? What kind of data rates you need? And that means what kind of USB protocols do you need? What yeah. microcontroller with flash and RAM and so forth, leading through analog circuit design, digital circuit design, and then in KiCad, which is V6, which has also just been released, or last Mm -hmm. month, I believe. Exciting, yeah. Through PCB layout and routing, how to choose parts, how to cost optimize, how to design interfaces, and then actually getting it ordered. So it was kind of hard to pack all that information in, you know, five-ish hours. But I think it gives you... Yeah, that's a ton in five hours. (laughs) Yeah, and that's the thing. I I mean, I can, if you can, leave a link to the course description, and it is... Just the description of the course or the content, though, just like in bullet points as a list is is a quite a number of pages. So I mm-hmm. hope it's 
it's hard. I don't know with your course also finding the balance of how much information do you put in, how long do you make the course and the lessons and so on. So I wasn't sure being, being yeah. that this is the first course. Yeah, I think I think what you're going to find is this this is like definitely like intermediate level. I think mm -hmm. this is you're going to need a lot of people that are interested in this sort of thing because of the audio. And I think you're going to get people taking it. Unfortunately, they're probably going to not have hopefully they can just follow along, which I think I think there's yeah. always value in that kind of building muscle memory, following mm -hmm. along, watching you do layout, copying the layout that that actually has a lot of benefit. But it, like if they then are like, all right, I'm going to go design my own custom thing now. It's like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's that's a huge jump. And I always like to think about I, uh, Akiba. We've had on the show a couple times in the past. He and I used to talk about like he would always talk about break dancing. And I would talk about like jazz. But I feel like okay. in the in the same way, like the first thing you have to do is learn how other people did it, right? You you know, like, yeah. like Charles Mingus didn't play like a a, a bang and solo the first time mm -hmm. he played. It was like he would learn the classics first and all of the basics and like how how music is structured. And then yeah. eventually you start to modify and play. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is like having having these kind of examples on your course or Robert's courses or, or my courses, like it's just about at the beginning, just following along and like as I tell people, so many other things can go wrong. Just try and follow the example yeah. first and mm -hmm. make sure you get through it. And if not, you'll learn a lot from that things going wrong. Exactly. It's almost like a thing when you, the first step when I look at a new IC is look at, you know, reference schematics, reference designs. And in essence, is what you say. You look at the reference design, just think, okay, how the hell am I going to do that? And just go through part by part. Yeah. And I hope the yeah. course kind of details that a bit more, that you're not on your own. Yeah. You kind yeah. of guide it through. And also found that not a lot exists on actually choosing or how to select parts. And it's mm -hmm. questions I often get on the YouTube channel as well is how do you even you begin? How, how do I know I need this <laughs> STM32 F3 parts yeah. or this specific resistor? So, yeah. 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 I think, I think about like, you know, like you tell someone, all right, you're going to go choose an op amp. And they're like, okay, where do I go? And you're like, oh, you, you go to DigiKey. And they go to DigiKey and they're like, whoa, what is going on yeah. here? <laughs> yes, it's exactly. Like, well, the thing is, you learn to like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's other flavors. You can try Mauser if you want. You can go mm -hmm. to Element 14 if you want. Really, you know, pick your poison, folks. It's uh, <laughs> Yeah. They no, got exactly. all the parts. So I don't know what you, you, you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. And it's just so, it must be, I mean, it still is overwhelming, right? Going to oh, like yeah, a mouse totally. or digital key part search yeah. and just, okay, what do I actually choose? But kind yeah. of over time, I guess you also like develop your favorite parts or familiarity. Mm -hmm. So you're always like, I go to STM32 for a microcontroller. Someone else might go to TI or microchip. But mm -hmm. I, you kind of build up, I guess, a little like parts reservoir, things you always right. want to go with. Yeah. 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 I always but, talk about like a mental library. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and one thing that's nice is like, you know, watching videos like yours, even if I'm not, you know, yours or Robert's or Dave's or anyone's like that, right? One thing mm -hmm. I'm doing is just kind of filing just the names in the back of my head so that when I hear, when I hear it later, when I hear a, yeah. an idea later, like, oh, I need to do, you know, a, a DAC circuit. I'm like, oh, I can mm -hmm. watch Philip's video on mixed signal stuff and just yeah. go and look at that and use that as a reference. And then almost having that as a, like a, a centralized location to start my search mm. party out from, you know, like, Oh, yep. I, I want a 16 bit DAC or I want a 12 bit DAC. And mm -hmm. here's the stuff that Philip thought was important. And do I think all this stuff's important around it as well? It's just so yeah. hard to, when you look at all of the specs that are on a spec sheet to know what to care about. Exactly. Yeah. And it's even harder if you're doing this on your own or as a hobby and having no one to ask. So in a company, I guess it's different because you usually yeah, have a mentor. Yeah. I don't know. I guess when I mean, you started at Samsung, right? And then Keith, Lee, I guess you had people around you to, I guess, supervise yeah. or design at review. Keith, at Keith Lee, there was not only was there, you know, mentors, like unofficial mentors, but then we would have, there were so many analog engineers there. We would have a meeting like with like 15 to 20 analog engineers in a room just talking about analog topics. And it's like, That's, man, you can't, okay. you, you literally couldn't pick a better place yeah. to like learn about that kind of stuff. That is so really that cool. I feel very grateful for that. That's but really cool. Yeah. It's not common, right? I mean, like, like no. I don't know how you would do that otherwise. No, it's also a thing. It's it's one thing I've also been noting because I've been working with scale up for I guess one one and a half years almost now, and that's the thing. I am the only guy doing electronics, so yeah, having no one to ask, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Of course, having the responsibility to make a product just by yourself, mm -hmm. but especially like I haven't I graduated I don't know three years ago, so mm -hmm. I'm not the most experienced person. So all of course would be nice to ask someone else. And just joining a startup, I found that quite difficult like who do you actually ask because no yeah. advice is really free of course you can go to youtube and 
sign up to courses, but yeah, yeah. in that sense, no, it I, would be good. I to found me. in the absence of, you know, so I, I also was at startup. I'm currently at startup. I, I mean, like I, I find that like, you know, a, a lot of it is, you know, you could do media type stuff, you know, finding people on YouTube, like you mentioned, if, yeah. if your company is big enough or has the connections or even if they don't, you could probably out, mm. reach out and, you know, like I think applications engineers are like my life lifeline for everything, you know, okay. and, but like trying to get their attention is usually the tough yeah. part if, you know, especially at a startup, but some of them are like, oh, startups, that's fun, you know, so, you know, lean, it, okay. lean into that sort of thing. So you actually send them just a mail asking, can you detail this or, oh, or totally. how do you do it? Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And actually the best ones I find are actually, you know, there's the the specific ones at like a chip company. So if you try and find like an ST like app engineer, that might be tough. But if you mm-hmm. have like a distributor with like some technical resources, I feel like they're like, if you can just like do a call with them and just talk through a design, because the other nice thing is, is the trade there is usually the information, right? They want to know mm-hmm. like, oh, well, Philip's got this design and it's got a DAC and an ADC and a microcontroller and all these other things. And they want to suggest other stuff in there. And so if you're willing to, you know, kind of open the kimono a little bit and show like, oh, here's what my design kind of consists of, they're going to be like, oh, well, let me offer you some more parts. But in doing so, they can often offer you advice and, you know, some guidance, which is very, very helpful. That's a very good tip. No, I I will definitely try that in the future. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to explore this via the YouTube, at least having that as a backing to say, okay, you know, you're not just an individual asking for little advice. You can always kind of, yeah. in return, ask for, for for a promotion or offer promotion. Mm-hmm. To try and do that to ask for advice, but that's a, I'll definitely go with that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I think you know, it, it, and it is this like, it's this weird kind of ad hoc network of of people. You know, really, to truly based around like commerce and money and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So there is always that value transfer. But it, the nice thing is, if you stay away from the sales side of it, right? If you yeah. don't like. You don't usually talk to a sales engineer. You, you just try and get to the technical person as fast as possible. At the yes. end of the day, that's going to be a nerd. And yeah. like, I want to just talk to nerds. Mm-hmm. Like that's, yep. you know, I want to geek out about a design and just like, oh, like, you know, I, I thought this was, you know, here's, you know, if you lead with like, oh, I had a problem with this, they're, they're going to be totally into, you know, digging into that problem, I feel like. So yeah, no, that's I'm, a good maybe, point. Yeah. yeah. Have you, have you experienced that all in like, like in Germany or in, in Denmark? Have you, have you been in touch with that crowd? Well, it was mainly at university. So at university, I was lucky enough to find a group of people who just loved mm-hmm. engineering, loved, even though it's like, it's, it's kind of a beginner level, right? You're just learning about basic circuitry and how to root things up. We didn't have even have anything about, um, you know, PCB design at university, which is another thing I find bizarre. Yeah, same. But yeah, just nerding out with people. I, I found it with a, with a friend of mine at the time, a drone club, you know, may building yeah, fixed wing aircraft and just being able to nerd out and try and figure out this system, which no one's worked on before, at least at our level, mm-hmm. was pretty cool. And just being able to nerd out and the same thing in a startup, you're just surrounded by people who are passionate about making technology, especially an engineering startup. And yeah, I mean, I haven't actually worked in, I worked on a larger aerospace company mm-hmm. for, th- for a very few months when I, when I left university, but that just wasn't for me. So yeah. I'm, I don't think I'm just the person to work in, a large company, you know, nine to five and do that thing. I prefer this kind of work. Yeah. I mean, the benefit of a big company is like you often you'll be able to find other people that might be a mentor or, or yeah. you know, technical resources, stuff like that. The downside is they're going to be like, well, Philip, you just designed this one little tiny part and just make sure it works perfectly yeah. and go to all these meetings, please. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's exactly the thing. It's that trade off of having the like little responsibility versus having people to ask. Mm-hmm. And I prefer the startup life to be honest, just Having that responsibility, trying to figure out a problem by yourself, of course, with a team of other people. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. But you, I mean, Samsung is a huge company. So I guess you had, and Keithley as well. So I guess you had the the more, I don't know, traditional route to start with. Yeah, I mean, Samsung was like a totally different thing. That was a that was a chip company. So like that, or sorry, mm-hmm. that was a chip fab. So I was not even doing electronics. I was doing process engineering. Okay. But at Keithley, yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty, the only reason that there was, that I, I was able to like put hands on to like deep technical problems is because it was a pretty small company. Actually, it was only like, I think it was like probably 50 total engineers, but okay. they had like a product line that had like 20, 25 products. And so, yeah. and I was doing like, you know, product, new product support or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, release product support. So that helped too, you know, just okay. being the repair, you know, a lot of people talk about being in repair first is a, is a great, 
a great way to see a lot yeah. of problems with okay. finished designs and that sort yeah. of thing. And that was straight after uni, university, you said, right? That was, uh, yeah, like two years after university. Okay. So, but did yeah. you have anything about PCB design at university? No, no. My first design was actually, my first uh, layout was in Eagle, mm-hmm. not watching YouTube, just like talking to people yeah. at, actually did, uh, YouTube had not started yet. That makes me sound old. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. What's that? Before 2007, 2006? Yeah, 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 yeah. YouTube, actually, it had just started. So it was uh, 2008. I started it at uh, Keefley. And uh, wow, YouTube wasn't a thing yet. So, you know, just like following guidelines from other people at the company and using Eagle. And, yeah. and back when Eagle wasn't owned by AutoCAD, it was like a German, just the German company that started it from had it around for many years. So yeah 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 boy no. philip that makes me feel old i gotta say i'm sorry no you better cut that out no 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 no, no that's great that's okay. great that's great yeah. yeah no but but yeah i just thought it was such a shame because to me pcb design is actually one of the most fun parts and actually yeah it's not just connect the dots right right it's controlled impedances spacing god knows what stack ups and it's a whole another side to engineering i hadn't been even exposed to at university yeah, I feel like, you know, at the university level, I, I asked that. I remember like asking this. Actually, I went to I went to a thing called the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department Heads Association. Okay. And I remember asking a question at like one of the round tables that was kind of in this realm of like, well, why you know, why aren't you teaching these things that are practical and, you know, that like people want to learn and stuff like that? And they're like, well, uh, you know, s- students will learn this over time and we don't have time to to like to learn all these programs or something like that it's like i don't care like that's your job is to like teach people this stuff i i I don't know i I feel like it's it's looked down upon maybe in Mm -hmm. like the up the echelons of uh you know ivory towers of education but yeah maybe i I mean i yeah i understand the fact that you should expose students as much as possible to introduce topics but in an electronics engineering degree not even mentioning pcb design or actual circuit design i find is a bit bit odd instead we proved i don't know like vector calculus like what yeah. was it stokes theorem or gauss's law and things like that it's yeah, yeah. A bit of a shame yeah but. i i do feel like it would be a good way to it almost would be like a good way to as like a framing for discussions or i guess it'd be probably more base physics but like talking about maxwell's equations and talking about it like using a pcb trace as a mm-hmm. as an example but yes. i feel like that because of the separation maybe between physics and and electronics or electrical groups Maybe that's why. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I agree. No, but it's no, it's a shame. But I, 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 I just hope because a, a friend of mine actually introduced me to KiCad when I was at university, and there's like, mm-hmm. you know, you see the cool black background, these Tron-looking traces, and that kind of got mm-hmm. me hooked to yeah, start yeah. with. But it wasn't actually the university doing that; it was through a friend. So yep. very thankful to him for introducing me to that. But oh, that's great. That's great. That's yeah, how it all I mean, started. Uh, and th- so that was in was that in service of that uh, that uh, the the fixed wing group that you mentioned? That was actually a, a different guy. I, we went to the same, well, the same university, same course, same year. And he, I don't know how he got into PCB design, but he just showed me this program, gave me the first little pointers. And yeah, that was, that's the, I know. And then you're hooked for life, right? Then you're that's, hooked, that's, right? That's, that's the beginning and the end. Sorry, man. Exactly. You're, Connect you're the dots now. for adults. I mean, perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's only surprise because it opens a whole world I didn't even know existed. And yeah. Um, yeah. it's, yeah, it's a nice thing to be able to do because in these days also with S and D components, mm-hmm. it enables you to go away from, I don't know, not to sound derogatory, but this hobbyist electronics, you know, where you have these mm-hmm. dip components or through hole resistors enables you to explore so much more of electronics, just being able to design PCBs, I find at least. So I, I think the, you know, the the hobbyist stuff or even just the, you know, the beginner stuff of like point to point wiring and breadboards mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I think that's an important stage in the yes. process. Yep. But like you said, I mean, like, I, I feel like it's just talking to people about like wanting to put your thing out in the world, just talking about like vibration on a quadcopter or a uh, yep. you know, fixed wing. It's like, yeah, the, that, that breadboard's not going to work. And yes. talking through it with people that are like, okay, yeah. So how do we make this more permanent? Well, mm-hmm. circuit board's the way. And uh, yep. and, and I, I think that transformation is, is very helpful for people. Yeah, no, definitely. As you say, like breadboarding definitely has its place and is great. And also for audio, like if you're just trying to, you know, design totally. different filters or anything like that, yeah. breadboard, you can't beat that. Yeah. But but enabling the use of these really small chips or FPGAs or God knows what, I think if you can design PCBs yourself, it's such a plus. Mm-hmm. And also, yeah, just working on projects, at least that's what I found with employers 
being able to have your own project, have designed PCBs, that was a huge plus. Oh, yeah. It makes you just really yeah. stand out. Standing out in the marketplace. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. People that are watching your videos, I mean, so you get a lot of feedback, mm -hmm. people that watch the videos and stuff like that. What are people coming in with knowledge wise? I mean, I guess people coming to the course now, but coming to YouTube prior to that, what, what is the, you know, what is the level of people coming in? I think it's quite mixed. So I would say it's usually beginner intermediate. I think it is that stage where you're kind of, you've, you've explored most of the capabilities of Arduino and then you're looking into, for example, how do I put the 80 mega that is used in an Arduino on a PCB? Mm -hmm. So, yep. so yep. that kind of level. So a lot of times university students studying electronics, uh, hobbyists, advanced hobbyists, that kind of, kind of area. I don't think you know, many professional people watch the videos. Maybe, maybe they do, but judging by the oh, comments, I it's... I, well, I yes. know people, well, other you, yeah. people uh, listen to the Amp Hour. We've referred to it before. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I, I think you'd be surprised. No, I mean, like, it's there's okay. a lot of... That's the other thing, too. Like, you know, even when you've been doing this for, you know, a bunch of years, it's... Mm -hmm. I can still learn a ton of stuff. I, I have learned a ton of stuff from your videos. So, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, like, that's the, that's the great thing is just, like, uh, being able to see lots... Of, having lots of examples at hand much yep. like the Jim Williams book of application stuff. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's so nice to be able to see that. Even if I'm like, oh, I, I think I know this. It might be something small within that circuit that yep. I could I could then go and crib later, you know? Yes. No, true. That's a good point. Yeah. And I also, I've tried to initially start it all, you know, with KiCad and PCB, but I've tried to like branch out a bit with like signal processing and control systems. So mm. luckily the viewers have responded well and I like kind of follow the channel along that way as well because it's Oh, yeah. you know, what, many what, kind of, what kind of stuff are you doing there? So a lot on various fundamentals of signal processing. So how do you design IR or FIR filters, mainly digital signal processing, and then also stuff like sensor fusion, extended Kalman filters. How do you do state estimation? How do you design a control system given you know a certain system? Kind of a, a mix of different things that I have personally find interesting and have needed in personal projects. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you got to figure other people are going to be doing that stuff too. And I, I feel like the something like a Z transform too. That's something where mm -hmm. you know you learn that in a digital processing class, and it's like, oh, okay, I understand the math. Exactly. But like actually like using it in the real world and like needing yeah. it for a filter design, it's like, oh, wait a second, this. Exactly. You know, I wish I wish they would have started with that. I hope that yeah. a you know a college professor puts on your video first thing and is like, "Hey, yeah. here's why you really need this." You exactly. Know? And it's to me that is still talking of like Z transform digital systems. Just the fact that you can add numbers in a certain way and multiply them in a certain way gives a different <laughs> yeah. frequency response is mental. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah totally right. <laughs> it's yeah. What was it? The Fibonacci series. You know, you can write that as a linear difference equation. Take the Z transform of the difference equation of the Fibonacci series, and it has a frequency. It, it doesn't make sense, of course, in that in that context. But just the fact that you right. can do that, yeah, I always thought it was mental. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. On yeah. that note, yeah. But no, I think no, that's good though too. I mean, I think it's like showing the the wonders of the you know the math and the physics that's all around us. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, I feel like that is just the you know kind of go back to the education piece. That's the step that always kind of gets skipped. And it's, it's at least what I was the hungriest for because I had such a hard time like sticking with it and like yes. understanding why I should be doing these stupid mm -hmm. problems over and over again. And it's like, but you can do all this cool stuff with it. You know, they should yeah. start with the cool stuff. Always start with the cool stuff. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's almost like when I was at university, my main resource was YouTube. Because as you say, that's where you see kind of more practical things. You get exposed to the university, but then to me, it was the university of YouTube kind of filling in those gaps and seeing how you can actually implement that. Yeah. Well, Philip, let me tell you the other things that didn't exist when I was at university. Oh God. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for bringing that up again. <laughs> Yeah, the well, iPhone. I, exactly. Uh, what my most dad's... of the internet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that, Gmail. Fair enough. Uh, fair enough. You, you definitely had it harder. My dad <laughs> always tells me about, you know, the slide rules and not having oh, a calculator. Yeah. So oh, that's even further I back. But. I can't even. Yeah. You know, I was just re-listening to uh, the uh, Richard Feynman. Surely mm -hmm. you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Yeah. And he was talking about just like how proud he was about like the being able to estimate like log tables and stuff like that. I was oh, like, yeah. why the hell would anyone care about that? And it's like, Oh, exactly. actually that makes you like a thousand times more capable as a physicist because yeah. there wasn't the, the calculation capabilities then. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. How we've moved on. 
I, I, I'm not trying to be like, uh, you know, kids these days, kind of, even though I did say that last week. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually great. I think that it, it yeah. lets you get to the fun stuff faster, right? It lets yeah. you get to the application level stuff faster exactly. instead of getting bogged down in the like, oh, you know, how do I, why do I even care about any of this stuff? It's just straight to the, well, I need this tool. Here's this tool. Here's how you do it. Watch the exactly. video and then you're good to go. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's great. Exactly. Yeah. And it just drives everything further as well to, to me, faster rate. I mean, it's crazy. Wasn't it like on a, on a credit card, you have more computing power than the first moon landing had? Yeah, probably. In, yeah. With like a, yeah, sim, stuff like that. Just, stuff like that. But yeah. no, it's cool. I mean, what, as you say, kids these days, what toys they can play with and they don't have to, you know, use an abacus or something. So <laughs> right, right. It's, it's pretty cool. So then I think the, I think that then the challenge is when you have all of the world's knowledge at your fingertips, it's like literally it's a, it's an attention problem at that point of like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I know I want to do this thing. I know I want to make a guitar pedal. Yeah. How do I do it? And then it's yeah. like, because I don't know about you, but I've been on, on many a, a rabbit hunt down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been on Wikipedia and just like, I, by the end of it, I'm like, I, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. You know, I, <laughs> I just yes. wanted to find an op amp and now I'm, you know, 15 pages yeah. deep on Wikipedia. And it's like, why am I looking at this? <laughs> I very much know the feeling. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's also a thing being able like not knowing what to choose, what to do next. Because there's so many cool projects mm. or things yeah, to do. Or, yeah. or even just looking at the details, like you look at an op amp, and then you look through, okay, how does an op amp work? What does the input stage do? And then you dive deep and deep and you kind of want to explore that and be able to do that. I just have such a hard time choosing what project to do next because they all just mm. sound like pretty cool. I don't know how you do that yeah. or if you even have the time outside of work to, to do your own projects. Yeah. I mean, these days I don't. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think honestly having, having like a secondary hobby though, that like, that feeds into it, that, that mm -hmm. has been, I think that's a, a great way to do it. I mean, you, you do it. You've actually posted, you've posted uh, music videos, I believe in exactly. the past as well. As well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to design when I have the time, uh, guitar pedals, guitar amplifiers, either if they're just analog or, you know, mixed signal. I think that's, as you say, it's cool being able to, to combine both of your interests or if you have more of course yeah. multiple of your interests and i think that's even what almost got me into electronics so i started playing guitar oh, yeah. about 15 years ago mm -hmm. and always thought okay like how does this guitar pedal even work this is distortion even though it has a single transistor and a couple passes around it and then finally being able to design it yourself and understand that it was is really rewarding yeah. And, yeah no that's great that's great yeah, and i think having that having that goal in mind is really important too because you know you want the the pedal at the end or whatever yeah. you've seen you've probably opened up other pedals you've seen what's involved that sort of thing exactly and it's it kind of repeats everything is once you've seen like one guitar pedal of a certain type like an, a distortion pedal you've you've almost seen them all and it's interesting to play around with that and then copy a bit and kind of go along and what kind of interest did, did you have that that merged with electronics was it also audio or music it was some audio stuff i mean not i, I don't even know it anymore you know, I got into some of the badge life stuff. So like doing blinkies and, mm -hmm. you know, just stuff that I yeah. found laying around. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, probably not the same. I mean, test equipment stuff a little bit, but okay. not, not nearly yeah. as much as people like Dave. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah I never really had like a really good, I, you know, I, I remember talking, I remember talking to a one of the engineers at Keithley actually. And I remember asking him like, well, what do you, what do you do when you, what kind of stuff do you work on at home? He's like, I spend 50 hours a week working on really intense analog circuits. When I get home, I ride my bike. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. oh yeah, okay, okay. You know, like, yeah. and uh, I think there is that, you know, sometimes like if you're using up all your your daytime hours on electronics, like some people I know that that are like the best at electronics are the ones who are like doing software all day and then they come home at night and they work on electronics right. or that yep. sort of thing. So uh, usually what I would do is I would work on electronics in the day and then I'd come home and talk about them on the podcast so yep. that, like i would say podcasting was my hobby you know okay <laughs> no i mean that's that also sounds like a better balance i always find it hard to strike because at work you have, you have to do you know certain projects yeah yeah and then you know if you have certain other also electronics or engineering projects that you want to work on you have to do it afterwards so yeah yeah it's it, for me it's easy to slip on into the the state of just doing electronics the whole day so i yeah. have to stop myself but well, you know, luckily we yeah, have the part shortage to deal with. So, you know, that, that is like a, it's like a exactly. governor on, so, our, on our activity and output. So <laughs> how, exactly. how has that been going with the, I mean, it's all, all your videos are uh, STM 32 based. Uh, how's, how's, uh, 
How's it all been well, going for you? That's been interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that has been very interesting. It's luckily passives aren't out yet, so at least I only need to have to redesign for the for the microcontroller. Uh, the thing is also sensors and as you said yeah. before we started recording, also with the you know, switching converters. Oh, it's just yes. a real but another on the positive side, I've been very good at uh, you know, making footprints. Because uh-huh. every, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, every iteration. week I have to make a new footprint, a new symbol for that. And then, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a challenge to also just then find parts or minimize the design time you need for then redesigning. So maybe in that way, mm-hmm. it's also a good, good practice. And it'll be so nice when it's back to normal at the end of this year. Hopefully oh, yeah. at the end of this year. Oh, hopefully, yeah, yeah. Uh, just I, to have I think... the freedom again to choose. Yeah. Sorry. I think one thing that's going to come out of this actually is um, when I think about like moving up the stack a little bit and like, uh, the amount of like maintenance that you'll need to have in order to like maintain multiple versions within organizations. Yeah. So like thinking about people that have 15 revisions of their circuit board and like, what if they have to target something differently? You know, if it's like a power converter, mm-hmm. okay, no big deal. But if there's like a sensor difference, now you're, you just branched your firm, your firmware and you have to say like, oh, well, Rev A has, yes. you know, this, the BME 280, but Rev B, we can only get the BMA 680. And so it's like, <laughs> so now you have different firmware maybe, and it like, yeah. gets loaded differently. So I think yes. what's going to come out of this time is like better tooling around that sort of thing and okay. just really more attention to it because yes. it's been necessitated by the silicon shortage. No, that's actually a good point. I hadn't thought about that. It's going to be like some sort of n-dimensional branch that just branches yeah, out on yeah. firmware. And... Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, that's a good point. I yeah. mean, the downside is that it's going to, uh, I think it's going to, you know, people are going to be dragging these these uh, things. This is just going to be baggage in organizations mm-hmm. for years and years and years. Yeah. Because, you know, if you've, say you have put out five different versions of your product and you've, but you've made 100,000 of each of them, it's like, those things are not going away anytime soon. So mm. you have to support them yeah. and test them. And yeah. That's true. I also wonder how it's going to be because people probably overbuying or hoarding yeah. you know, certain yeah. ICs, how that's going to like, if it's going to overshoot once production starts ramping up again yeah. and then people don't want to buy and then maybe shut it down. I wonder how that is going to run out as well. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, like, will they just, like, use up their in-house stock and stuff like that? Yeah, and if it'll settle again, I mean, I don't actually, what was actually the main reason for causing it, do you know? Because people say, you know, it was, it was Corona, it was some fire in some factory. Do you actually mm-hmm. know? I'm not too informed. Not uh, not specifically. I mean, I think mm-hmm. I think there's been a lot of push-pull around Corona, but I think a lot of it has been, like, reacting to reacting, you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, I talked to a friend recently, and he's like, yeah, I switched... You know, I had to switch microcontroller platforms. I'm like, okay, well, you know, that that happens. Uh, it sucks, but but he's yeah. like, yeah. Then I just like bought three reels of the components. I was like, yes. oh. And so then you think about how that hits the supply chain, then because now, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe there was stock of that one part before my friend bought it out, but now whoever was planning on that stock being in distribution has just hit the same problem, and so it just kind of like moves down the chain. Okay. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, for companies that have enough capital to deal with that, I guess it's still kind of okay. So if it's a big car company or God knows mm-hmm. what, but but hobbyists and also as I've seen in the startup, it's a real yeah. real trouble. And and you I mean, luckily like governments and loans and God knows what are usually more lenient because of the chip shortage and because of corona, but it's been a real real problem having to redesign, not being able to get enough chips. And if yeah, yeah. if you don't have the the financials to actually purchase a certain amount to fit your design or mm-hmm. production needs. That's a, that w- what I've seen is a real problem. But yeah, yeah. no, that, I mean, I think, I think that's gonna, you know, there's, we're what two years in now and it's like some companies are just like running on fumes and running on their backs, you know, their back yes. stock basically, and just hope, you know, just clearing out their shelves and selling yeah. everything underneath themselves. But hopefully, you know, hopefully yeah. the builds are going there. I think also hopefully like the, you know, the distributors, are giving credit and stuff like that too, yeah. or, or CMs are giving credit, but yes. yeah, it's tough in the small, the small kind of volumes. Yeah. I mean, what, what kind of volumes are you usually designing in? The, usually for type like in the startup, at least for like the 50 to hundreds, yeah. which yeah. isn't huge, of course, in comparison, mm-hmm. but then, yeah. then again, it's an early stage startup. It's existed for just over a year, mm-hmm. but it's still at a volume in that if you need, I mean, a certain PCB I was making, fairly complicated you know over 500 600 parts yep various different ics and you have to redesign for all of them or have those in stock for 100 and then 
times I don't know how many components are on that board. That can be a serious problem for startups. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, as a consultant, have you how much have you had a problem with that when you're oh, doing designs for clients? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's just having hard conversations with them. Be like, look, here's the reality right now. You can either buy and hold all this stock up front so that you're are certain that you can build this thing. And even still, you know, you're going to make some some uh, hard decisions on what is or isn't in your product because of that. Or mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, as the, the consultant, I'm going to redesign it three times just to work with whatever's there. And then there's just less reliability. Like, so then it's either I have to put more testing towards it or we have to just kind of yeah. cross our fingers or, you know, and so it really depends where it is in the mm-hmm. life cycle of the product. But it's just a, it's just a, crap situation all around it just sucks it's no fun like like people have been saying on twitter it's just not fun to be in hardware right now and it's like it's not but it's um it's important exactly yeah no it's been kind of stressful as you say because every time you make a design change even just designing on it's making a small change but having to change Mm -hmm. ic's every single time it's the most stressful thing waiting for your boards to come back and hoping they'll work yeah right exactly yeah yeah you know and so like i think you know again like other like silver lining type things are like there's going to be modernization of documentation systems just because you have to like, you know, there's just more churn right now. Like, so everything yeah. that, that churn results in, I think, you know, so you need to be able to document it better. You need to be able to write more flexible firmware. You need your sourcing groups to be a little bit better about maybe paying for things up front, whether they were like net 30, net 60 before, you know, it's just like you do what you got to do. But I think, I think it'll be operationally better for companies at the end of the day. Yeah. No, that's, that's, very very true and there's also aren't they making new like fab houses or fab plants in the u.s now because of this i mean that's going to take yeah. ages i assume to, yeah, to even exactly. set up yeah I but mean, it's, and, and they're all targeting so. at the top end you know like that's the real problem is that like yeah so intel might be buying, buying new or you know putting up new fabs or tsmc is talking about putting some second gen fabs here um samsung's growing my, my own employer yeah. but it's like that's that's not what I care about. You know, I, I want <laughs> TI to put, you know, I want exactly, TI to yeah. reopen their, their Richardson plant to full capacity. And like, mm-hmm. I want some of the Silicon Valley plants that are doing like 300 nanometer or sorry, a hundred millimeter wafers and stuff like that. You know, yeah. it's just like the stuff where it, it didn't make financial sense and they all moved yes. it overseas. And now it's like, no, no, no. Open those back yeah. up, please. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. But, but how do you do it then on a, like a personal level, like as a, for your own personal projects, if you work on them, do you just design it like, you know, a week before and trying to send it off as quickly as possible? Or uh, I have taken the tact that I will not, I will not send out a circuit board for design until I have the parts in hand. Yeah, because it's I've gotten burned so many times. So yes. okay. basically, my my latest design, I ordered a bunch actually from LCSC, not from not from DigiKey, because yeah. there was a bunch of stuff I couldn't get. And mm-hmm. so I bought a bunch of parts, like enough to build 50, even though I only need five. So I'm part of the problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then I sent off the board because I was just like, I, the time, the time to wait that, that small amount of time is, is worth it, uh, versus yes. getting to the end and then being like, oh, no, no that's true. available. So, yeah. Yeah. How about for you? Well, because I, I'm luckily enough to be sponsored by GLC, so I can use their services with the PCBs, and they also have their, you know, that parts library. Mm-hmm. So, in a in a way, of course, it's great because I can just use them and I, I know what I'm getting. But I can't like pre-order parts unless they're like a minimum quantity. So I don't want to get a thousand uh, SCM32s because I'm yeah, maybe yeah. bankrupt. But um, I and that makes it hard. So I have to design really quickly. So usually I. Mm. I I mean, I design fairly simple boards for the YouTube channel. And that's yeah. pretty much where I use JLC PCB for. So I can do it like a day or two in advance and then just try and order it. But of course, sometimes that doesn't work out and the parts do go very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So, it's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been designing this FPGA, you know, the Silent Zinc uh, FPGA? Yeah, yeah that one's system nuts. On chips. Yeah. yeah, I've been designing all of that. And that's where I have gone the route like you have, like pre-ordering the parts, getting them in, and then finishing the design. Wow. So, Yeah. That's, that's that's kind of route I go with with more involved projects, and, and that's like a lot per chip too, right? That's like a hundred dollars minimum per yeah. chip as well. So exactly, like and crazy. they've gone up as well the the prices for that. So oh yeah, I'm surprised everybody's yeah. not charging a thousand dollars a chip at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So no, but that's actually quite a cool little project. I'm trying to make like a yeah. system on module for the zinc because I for work or for fun, just for fun to be honest. Oh it's, cool. Uh, okay. I wanted to make. Well, first, a flight control system based on the zinc, just just to mm-hmm. to see, or some sort of general control system. But then I think, okay, I could also use this for like audio processing. 
So yeah. instead of making a dedicated board for each, I, I just went the route of making a system on module mm. that I can just plug in, you know, via board to board mezzanine connectors. Uh, so okay, so you're kind of going modular at that point, it's... right? You're, you're, uh... Exactly, yeah. 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 So it's been interesting, to, like routing DDR memory, routing out a BGA with like fairly fine pitch and adding peripherals. So that's quite different to the stuff you usually see on the YouTube channel. Yeah, but of course, quite a lot, quite a lot more involved than than like STM thirty two designs or something like that. Yeah, I mean, have well, you I mean, have you done a lot of zinc stuff or a lot of FPGA stuff in your work? Uh, a lot of my age is going to be showing here again. The last time I did anything <laughs> professionally with a uh, FPGA, it was the Vertex four. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, yeah. yeah, it's been a long time. So okay. Uh, well, at least you didn't say like PL or PLA circuitry. Yeah, no, that's more like Dave's. That's like Dave's uh, okay. uh, realm. Uh, he did a lot of CPLD and PAL stuff. Okay. But he also did, to be fair, he also did a lot of other, other FPGA yeah. stuff after that. Okay. I feel like this is another like application level thing. I feel like audio could play well in this realm. A lot of mm -hmm. like anything like streaming is really good in that way. Yeah. But, um, you know, just the smaller stuff that I'm normally doing, it doesn't feel like that's as ne necessary. Yeah. No. How has it been on the uh, on the software side, like actually setting up that the software tool chain for for doing like an audio thing with the Zinc? So it's, I mean, the whole Zinc thing is in general also with FPGAs is quite a steep learning curve. So luckily, the tools from Zilinx and I believe also from Intel on, or whatever they used to be, Altera. Altera, that yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, luckily they're free for for most chips they have but it's quite a steep learning curve just setting up and writing your own like vhd or, or verilog and then setting it up and i haven't i'm still yet to produce those boards so i've done the layout and routing mm -hmm. and the schematics so yeah. actually doing a board bring up for something you've designed yourself rather than using you know like a digital board or mm -hmm. some sort of yeah. developer board is that's to me still something that lies ahead so it'll be interesting to see how that board bring up goes also like things like testing ddr you know writing mm -hmm. a script that actually tests that your board layout works and they're not exactly like cheap to produce these boards when you have goodness how many layers with impedance control and you're doing it as a hobby thing so that'll be interesting to do how many layers of the board have to be for a zinc chip uh, so six at least i'm doing it okay. with eight uh, okay. just because because at least from my experience, is if you go over eight, it's kind of not poolable usually, and it quite increases the cost. Also, if you want controlled impedance, so eight is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. I didn't know. I I haven't actually seen any pooled services for eight layer. I've seen two, four, six okay. for sure. So I have the. I don't know. I usually use Euro circuits otherwise for work and for for, mm -hmm. for if I can't use like the JLC PCB parts catalog. So they, I think, have a pooled eight layer. Oh, cool. Which is fairly inexpensive. But that, of yeah, course, is in yeah. Europe. So for US customers, I'm not sure how. Uh, it's not too bad, actually. Uh, user, I mean, is Euro it? Circuits is, is uh, you know, pretty big name for going across the pond. But uh, okay. but yeah, they're DFM tools, too. Really, really I great. I love those, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So useful. <laughs> Save my butt once. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. It's, oh, that's really, and they're really quick as well. So yeah, I'm very happy also with work with them. So yeah, yeah. so hopefully that will come on the YouTube channel at some point, some sort of zinc-based tutorials. and Yeah. But that is... I feel like that's another big shift, though, too, is like, you know, so now you're like, okay, you're learning circuit design stuff, and people are like, all right, I get that. And it's like, okay, well, we're yeah. going to do, you know processor stuff okay yeah i get that and now fpga stuff is like oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes you know it's yeah. just like a whole different paradigm of like how exactly. to think about programming it's barely pro yeah. i mean it is programming but it's it's it's, it's very different yeah. that way exactly so. but i hope it's like kind of like, like i'm learning with this as well and i hope mm. you can kind of like the take the viewers along as cheesy as it sounds but like for no, the right you yeah, know yeah, yeah. that i'm learning and trying to show okay i've moved from stm32 to something like a zinc and it's mm -hmm. you know Something like that. So what? So have you done like the digital board side of things yeah. in the past? Exactly. Yes, yeah. so I've got a couple. I've got like the you know the RT one, which is the Spartan. Yeah. I've yep. uh, Got the Zybo, which is the Zinc one, and it's of course useful to kind of like then build up or code for those, and then mm -hmm. use some of those ideas to bring that into your own board. So totally. luckily, Digitalin has a lot of these reference schematics available, and then quite frankly, I am copying quite a fair bit from them yeah, just because it not? works. But I think. <laughs> As a hey first. man, it's just like we talked about at the beginning. It's like exactly. you copy it and you're still going to mess stuff up just because you're copying it and, exactly, and you'll learn yeah. from that, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> you root everything but one line correctly and you can throw yeah, the whole board right. away. It's, yeah. It's, right. yeah. Now, you, now you'll be sitting yeah. there with a very tiny drill uh, drilling out that, uh, <laughs> that 
exactly. layer three plane. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. Always these spider webs of, of cables running around. But yeah, 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 but no, I think that's, to me, that was the way of just doing it, just playing around with development boards. I guess that's most people's route, I guess, right? I, th- I think so. Yeah, I think that, you know, like that, uh, that same kind of like just following other people's examples and all the samples that are out there. I've been really surprised, you know, as I meet more people kind of in the firmware software realm that are like really good at stuff, the ones who like wow me with, with their like ability to turn around a demo really quickly or like people like hackathons back when those were a thing. Yeah. The ability to be able to replicate a demo feels like mm-hmm. magic to me because like okay. you have to, you have to kind of like take in all of the stuff that is, are, you know, tangential to maybe an idea. You then have to be able to follow directions very well. Obviously that's its own kind of skill, but then like being able like knowing what knobs to tweak then too. It's almost like when people are looking at DigiKey and they're like, I don't even know what to look at or what to tweak. When I look at like an API, I'm like, what? there's so yeah. much stuff here. You know, like, it's just like, yeah. and, 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 and like being able to like sit, you know, have a little discomfort with it, but then like being able to be like, all right, I know how to do this. I know how to interact mm-hmm. with an API and like, and then like which knobs to turn, you yes. can do some really cool stuff there. And you're going to learn so many other things in the process because, you know, the tool chain might break or whatever else. So it's its own yeah. kind of skill set. I feel like. No, exactly. Yeah. No. And it's, and it's cool just being able to explore all these different areas and then just build up and build up. So yeah. I wonder, wonder what's next after that. But uh, let's see. Yeah, building a spaceship or something, man. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. Because FPGAs always seem to be like the pinnacle, like once you've reached FPGA level, you know, what's beyond mm-hmm. that in the digital domain. But I just think it's it's pretty exciting. Just, again, opens more doors. It's like moving from Arduino to, to SM32. Or then yeah. that's the next yeah. thing. So Yeah, no, knows? I think that's good. I think about like, uh, you know, because FPGAs are so good at like, high speed and like you know fast throughputs type of stuff i always think like that's a really well targeted at like learning video or learning like high speed protocol type stuff you know like being able to push a lot of data around that that's where fpgas really shine and i feel like if you can find interesting applications there you know maybe you make Mm. a filter that goes into your camera because you do all these youtube videos right so uh, exactly yeah somewhere like that and also kind of maybe trying to also ease the learning curve for others because mm-hmm. it is quite steep, especially for FPGA. So, yeah, I hope uh, that I can, you know, make a video or two just demonstrating like this will get you maybe started quicker. But yeah, let's yeah. see. That's yeah. the that's the goal for this year. But let's see. Yeah, I think yeah. I think even if people are picking yeah. up like, you know, just a, a a thing here or there from the overall video, then that's still it's still valuable. You know, like like we were kind of talking about at the beginning with like, you know, so I look at a Jim Williams app note and I look at like again back to that thermocouple circuit. Most of that, I'm like, I, mm, that's this is not for me. But there might be, you know, one thing that's in there that even if I just learn it for that one thing and put that in my mental library, that's super useful. You know, yes. it's some, I'm, I might run into a similar problem later and be able to refer back to it and then really dig in. And uh, yep. so no, same exactly. thing with like FPGAs. I feel like it's like if you can kind of take a zoom back and mm-hmm. and say, not just here's how you do it, but here's why it's important. And that's what a lot of your videos do well yeah. is like then then people can, you know, come back to it as they need to. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. No, I hope that can, I can do something along those lines. It's always, I don't know, I mean, also, do you still do courses as well? My courses are still there, but I'm not, I'm not actively designing okay. anything new, so. Yeah, no, it's a thing of also coming up with, with content, I guess, for YouTube that is different or not already on YouTube. So mm. I hope that's one thing to add. As you say. Yeah, I think, you know, doesn't even have to be that different. I think, you know, like mm. it's that like, okay. there's, I, I, I remember like when I started doing courses and stuff like that, I was like really worried. I was like, oh no, someone's going to do exactly the course that I'm doing. And then I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, but actually that would be great because then there would be different ways to see the same thing yeah. as well. You know, like, and I was thinking yep. about it because it was like, I was going to invest all this time and then, you know, no one was going to be interested, but people yes. are going to be interested because of the way I do my stuff or the way you do your stuff. And like people are invested in, in you. So I feel like that. Yeah is also no, that is a good point yeah they're coming towards you know like i'm sure that many people that are signing up for your course hopefully some people here listening are are interested and i would recommend it that'd be very nice but Thank you. uh i'm sure a lot of them are going to be people that are already familiar with your videos and, and like your style yeah no no that is a good point yeah and even if it's just something as you say just a small thing you pick up i guess that's that's, that's all even worth yeah, quite a bit it doesn't have to be the whole, i mean i guess a lot of people will be familiar with most of the content in the course at least if they're signing up for it but if you can mm-hmm. just pick up one or two things that will improve your designs in the future then exactly i hope that's worth it yeah 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 i think watching watching other people design you know it's like uh 
what's a good example? I mean, like watching other people paint, right? Is you can learn stuff from their technique and you might watch the whole painting, but only take one thing out of it, but yeah. it's still a worth worthwhile thing. Yeah, no, exactly. Let's talk a little bit more about the course to close this out. I mean, so, sure. so we kind of talked through some of the, uh, the various sections there, but was there anything there that like you think is something that is in every design that people should be like focused on, like uh, pull-up resistors or ESD protection? That's using one example there. Yes. Um, no, I mean, on the point of ESD protection, I think that is also something I get asked a lot about. And there's actually quite a lot of detail to choosing the right ESD protection, you know, depending on what bus speeds or signal speeds you're using, mm -hmm. uh, what frequencies you're interested in or what voltages you're running at. So that is listed in the course as well. I can't go into, or don't go into much detail given the time of the course. But these small things that oftentimes in the YouTube videos, or because maybe even ESD protection is integrated into mm -hmm. yeah. uh, certain chips, so SM32 might have internal ESD protection, but of course, ESD protection should be placed, for example, close to a connector, it should be rated appropriate to what voltages you'll be working with. Mm -hmm. Small tips like that, that you maybe not usually find in maybe the YouTube videos I'm doing. So it goes into more and more detail rather than, okay, here's a chip, here's some pull-up resistors. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the whole process you need to think about when you are designing a product, even if it's just a prototype. Yeah. So yeah, it's just hopefully just little tidbits, kind of a whole span. It's fairly broad. And you know, even with like ESD protection or EMI filtering, you could make a whole course just about that. Oh, totally, yeah. So it's almost like presenting you with these ideas and showing you how you can maybe develop them further. So I give like references and links and other videos to help you out or set you on your path, what you might need. Yep. So as long as you know something exists, I guess you can always track it down further. Yep. Yeah. We, uh, we actually mentioned that on the, uh, the show last week. I had uh, my friend okay. Charlie, who's an educator on, and I, I, the, the what to Google for problem, right? And it's yeah. basically you're, you're giving people a list of what to, what to think about. It's almost like a checklist of, of things to think through. And then once you yes. do that, it's like, all right, I want to know a ton about ESD. Well, this isn't yes. where you learn that. You learn that on, you know, someone else's site. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Right? It's like 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 starting the spark or whatever you call it, right? Just uh, mm -hmm. yep. just showing people this is this is what you probably will need. Here's the basics of choosing it. If you want any more details out there, but this is just like like rules of thumb. I had one actually good, very good university lecturer. Mm -hmm. He was the only one who actually taught proper circuit design and especially also in analog electronics, when you're just mm -hmm. designing circuitry that's supposed to work, not very precise circuitry, it's all about like rules of thumb. And I kind of like that approach that you get given certain rough guidelines and if you want, you can dive deeper. Yep. So yeah, so that's- If I think back to like my uh, my time with the Keith Lee analog engineers, that was a lot of what I, you know, like we'd be sitting around a whiteboard and I remember Matt, one of the one of the guys that was older than me, not, not too much older, but had been there a while and definitely knew his stuff. And he'd always talk about these mantras, you know, just like, all right, we're talking through a circuit and we're like, all right, and we know that B equals L, D, I, D, T. And so because yeah. of that, when this inductor gets cut off over here, we're going to see a voltage spike. And, yes. and it was just like ways that he would talk through circuits and these, you know, that's not really, that is an actual, an actual law, not a law, but like a, that is an equation around gui guiding voltages and stuff with mm -hmm. inductors, but like, but like having that as a mental model then to then yeah. build out the rest of your knowledge around the circuit is super super useful yes, and i feel definitely. like the the experience is is just kind of like knowing where to apply that and how how it's relevant to a circuit yes no exactly yeah and yeah with the course i hope that'll that'll help some people out just to set them on the on the right path i, th I think you will be that that guiding voice yeah i think i think that's Hopefully. that's the idea yes. yeah. <laughs> no i do do very much hope so and of course as always any positive or negative feedback helps me out as much as it does people who you know sign up for the course because i'm always still learning as well i guess everyone is <laughs> yeah 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah. great i think having those those pointers to to where to dive in deeper yeah and like and and just follow along and see what you're doing and hopefully do you i mean is, is the idea that people should be following the course exactly and have the same output as as what you're creating close to i mean ideally i give i give the schematic files i give the parts libraries but I don't give the final board layout and board routing mm -hmm. as part of design because that to me is the part which makes the most sense to do yourself for every yeah. student to do themselves just to go through the motions where do I put my vias what traces do I use just mm -hmm. watching will not teach you anything I think like I've always just learned the best by actually implementing what I've been taught 
Yeah. Totally. So to me, that made the most sense not to include those files because it's easy to say, yeah, he did it. I'm sure I can do it myself mm-hmm. rather than yeah. having to do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I used to do with, with contextual electronics is I would give them like a commit number. So I'd be like doing commits throughout the process. Each yeah. video would end with a, you know, I'd commit the code to GitHub. And so it's like, okay, so if you want to practice this specifically, go to the commit before or go to the commit after, <laughs> yeah. delete all the stuff and then start over from that same spot. And you just have like a, like a part placement kind of thing. And then your parts are already placed. And you just do the layout. That's sort yes. of thing. Yeah. No, I think that's, yeah, the great way, a really great way of learning. Actually, you have to do it to be able to learn that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, even so though I'm not a, a gym goer, that is the uh, the equivalent of getting your reps in, I believe. Exactly. Uh, there we go. <laughs> only, only practice will, will yeah. Uh-huh. Practice makes perfect. Is that what we're going towards? <laughs> I think so. Isn't that the usual yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say yeah. Uh, it. It uh, practice makes better. Uh, yes. <laughs> no perfect. No perfect yeah. involved. The, the limit tends to being perfect, but never gets. That's right. Yeah. Right. That. Right. Right. It's a. It's a infinite series. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, Philip, where can people find you, your course, your YouTube channel? How do people find you online? Yeah, so if you just Google Phil's Lab or type Phil's Lab into YouTube, it should hopefully be the first thing that pops up. Uh, I also have videos on that channel to anything about hardware design and electronics, signal processing. You'll also find links to the course. If you want to go to the course, you can do go to phils-lab.net forward slash courses, and that'll show you all the course content, what you need to know, and also a link of where you can sign up. Awesome. So that should get yeah. people going. We'll have some links on here as well. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend checking out Philip's videos. And uh, this course is is a great next step to really dive in deeper. I think people could really benefit from that sort of thing. Yes. Well, well thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining me. It's been great. It's been great to, to catch up with you and uh, talk through education and electronics. I, I look forward to future videos and seeing what you do next. It's been great to talk to you. So thank you yeah. so much. Bye-bye.